Hello and welcome to Space. And this month we're taking a close look at the pressing issue of space debris. There are literally millions of objects up there in orbit flying out of control. They pose a risk to satellites and to astronauts. So what can be done? We're here at ESA's base in the Netherlands to find out. There are an estimated 8,000 tonnes of space debris in orbit, 29,000 tracked objects over 10 centimetres in size and over a million fragments too small to follow. Collisions do happen and every piece of debris is a danger. The point which is of importance is that even a very small debris, because of the speed at which it travels, if it hits another body or a working satellite, would make it, would make it exploding, creating a cloud of debris. So even a small debris is of importance. Every year, 200 of Europe's space debris experts get together at ESA's technology centre in the Netherlands to discuss how to clean up space. They represent the satellite companies, rocket firms and space agencies, and they all agree on what needs doing. The problem of the space debris has to be fixed in two ways. First one, we need to stop polluting. Uh, and second way, we have to remove the garbage, if you want, and the debris. First, let's have a look at dealing with the debris. Here in Europe, engineers have put forward a mission called ED Orbit, which aims to demonstrate that it's possible to capture an out-of-control satellite and take it out of harm's way. Right now, they're using this robot and a model satellite to work out how they could approach a big piece of space junk. We use the camera, which is mounted on, on the smaller robot arm, to mimic, to reproduce the motion of the satellite around the, the, target, uh, the, the target satellite that we want to deorbit, to capture. Once we are sure we are moving like a single object, we are like, as if we were dancing, but without touching it, uh, each other, we can move the robotic arms to grab the launcher adapter ring. And then once we have this grabbed, and, and, uh, we can also clamp another mechanism so that we can steer the, 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 the target orbit, the target satellite, with two hands, let's say. So it makes us easy to bring it down to the Earth and destroy it in, in, in the reentry or in the South Pacific Ocean. Another approach being studied within the ED orbit project involves using nets flung into space to capture big lumps of space debris. So the concept is to, uh, let's say, to mimic uh, what the fishermen uh, do uh, in, on, on the sea, and so to have a very large net to stay away from our debris and uh, med satellites that is stumbling and moving uh, freely, and then from that distance to uh, uh, keep our net and you just try to wrap all over your, uh, your satellites. And then, thanks to the motions of the satellites that is completely unknown and free, uh, you, you have the nets that wrap in around uh, your object. So at that point, we can, uh, we can bring uh, the object that we wrap it wherever we want in space, uh, like we do with, uh, with fishes in seas. Right now, ED Orbit doesn't have the financing and support it needs to launch. So millions of euros worth of satellite hardware remains at risk from collision. There are people at risk too. The International Space Station makes regular maneuvers to avoid space debris over 10 centimetres in size. And to protect the astronauts against smaller debris that can still do fatal damage, the engineers have built them a kind of coat of armour. The debris arrives, punctures this layer, which scatters the impact into a huge number of smaller fragments. This cloud of fragments is then absorbed into this second layer, which is a layer of Nextel and Kevlar, which makes sure that this internal part, the pressurized part where the astronauts live, isn't perforated. The drive to keep space debris at bay is growing as more satellites are launched. Today, there are around 2,000 active spacecraft, either in low Earth orbit or far away in geostationary positions. Distant satellites are simply parked, while satellites closer to Earth come back home, breaking apart as in this video of the ATV resupply ship during re-entry. Wow. Large parts like solar panels are burnt up in the atmosphere, but tough components in titanium and steel survive and hit Earth. Engineers are studying what happens in those brief destructive moments with a view to building satellites that will break apart when we would like them to. 
I think it's possible to create a satellite that would disintegrate during atmospheric re-entry, and that's what we're working on. And for the moment, we're really just at the beginning of that process. Right now, we're trying to understand what happens to the materials we use now, and then we'll see how we can improve them, how we can work on the design and conception of the satellite, how the different parts of the satellite break up in relation to each other in order to have a satellite which is safer at the end of its life and create the smallest amount of debris on Earth. In the early decades of space exploration, little thought was given to space debris. Now awareness is growing especially as space operators spend more time and money avoiding collisions. So who is ultimately responsible? Everybody polluted. Uh, some countries have polluted more than others, but simply because they were launching more than others. I don't think that we can clearly uh, pinpoint and say this is a good guy and this is the bad one. According to how much you launch, in a way, that's how much you have polluted. From now on, new satellites from Europe follow guidelines that ensure their end of life is planned for and defined. However, the risk of in-orbit collision remains. And now to the latest episode in our mini-series, Legends of Space, looking back at some of the greatest moments in spaceflight. This month, we're looking back to November 2014, when Rosetta's Philae probe touched down on a comet. November 2014, we had to deploy the land of Philae to the surface. And this was a quick turnaround period. So if you think, beginning of the year, we didn't really know what the comet looked like. And before the end of the same year, we had to deploy 100 kilograms of robotic lander onto the surface. I persistently thought every day that everything was gonna fall apart. The stress level on, that, on, on Rosetta was incredibly high. just joy and relief and uh, okay a couple of minutes uh, later I heard from my dear friends that it was uh, still jumping but it was on the surface of the comet you know that for me was basically secondary you know just that we got it down it had landed It was a moment of real joy. Everyone was hugging each other. There was no more rank or political hierarchy or anything else. It was a victory of humankind over a mythical object. Ultimately, this was an international endeavor that enabled this to happen. So for me, that's, that's the legacy of Rosette, to see what you can do when you can work together. Well, that's all we've got time for in this programme, but you can watch other episodes of Legends of Space and keep up to date with other news from the universe on our website, euronews.com.